Australia. Good evening, it's Wednesday the 22nd of April. Our top stories tonight. Four police officers killed in a horror crash on a major Melbourne freeway. China's military ramps up its presence in the South China Sea. The US state of Missouri sues Beijing over the coronavirus pandemic. And Britain set to begin human trials of a COVID-19 vaccine. You're watching The World. First, to that shocking freeway crash in Melbourne that has killed four Victoria police officers. It's the largest loss of police life in a single incident in the state's history. We're going to ABC reporter Amelia Turzon, who joins us live from the scene. Amelia, we're waiting to hear from the police minister. We'll cross to that shortly, but take us back to earlier this evening. What happened? Well, this has been an incredibly dark night for the Victorian police force. What we know is that this afternoon, about 5.30, a police car pulled over a Porsche that was speeding along this highway, one of Melbourne's busiest freeways. Now, those police officers have pulled over that Porsche and they've made the decision to impound that person's car and they've called along two other officers to the scene to help them out. And now what we know is that when those four police officers were out of their cars, on the highway along with the driver of that vehicle a semi trailer a large truck has driven Amelia, along the highway I'm going to... and it, it, it has careered em directly. Amelia we're going to have to leave you there we're going to come back to you in a little while but let's go right now to the Victoria police minister Lisa Neville uh, firstly you know I was notified by the chief commissioner just after six o'clock that um, what had occurred, what appeared to have occurred at that point uh, and he also notified the Premier and we had a number of updates during the evening. Um, so, you know, obviously we're in a better position or Chief Commissioner was when he stood up about some of the facts that are involved. Uh, the Premier and the Chief Commissioner and myself will update everyone tomorrow, first thing in the morning, on some of the facts as they come to light overnight. And I know the Premier has also made uh, some we'll make some announcements, but for example, things like half mast flags tomorrow at Parliament, um, and he'll have some more to say about that tomorrow. So, look, you know, there are really no words that you can adequately use tonight to express what's happened, and uh, you know, it is an unimaginable tragedy. Uh, you know, I, you know, I know that the Victoria Police family is really grieving tonight. Um, you know, I'm a small part of that, and I'm certainly hurting tonight. Uh, my thoughts and my prayers particularly are with the family and friends of our four police officers who lost their lives tonight. You know, they, would, they went to work uh, with every expectation of coming home safely. You know, it is a dangerous job as a police officer, but we still want every police officer to come home safely to their families at night. That didn't happen this evening for four um, individuals and their families. Um, they, they're heroes. They are heroes. Uh, they're Victorian heroes tonight. As the Chief Commissioner has said, this is the single, single biggest loss in one incident for Victoria Police. Uh, and it's hard to explain just what that means, what the, the ache is that is left behind for Victoria Police members uh, and, and, uh, and the community. This doesn't just hurt Victoria Police members, it hurts the whole community. Uh, we are, you know, we rely so much on our Victoria Police members in the job that they do, keeping us safe. We've seen it over the last few weeks. We've seen it during bushfires. They do an incredible work um, job every single day. So when some, someone is injured, someone is harmed, someone is, is killed in the line of duty, it hurts every single one of us. Um, but as a community, we need to come together. And tonight is about sending a very strong message to Victoria Police members, to the families involved, that we grieve together. We stand here this evening as one. Um, that what has happened tonight touches all of us. 
uh, and that we will stand with you, we'll stand with the police force and we'll stand with families in the weeks and months ahead as we try and get through and understand uh, what has happened this evening. So I'll ask Wayne, I know he wants to speak to his members as well. Uh, thank you, Minister. And I'd, I'd like to thank the Minister and the Premier for the support they've offered tonight, of course, um, and, and uh, the many others' messages of support. Um, I will say this, um, uh, that news that came through uh, earlier this evening is flawed us, to be quite honest. It, it's just flawed us. To lose a member, to lose any member, but to lose four on one occasion is incredible. And this will be felt in every police station in every mess room, in every watch house across the state tonight. There'll be police officers uh, grieving. There'll be police officers who trained and who served with these uh, men and women. There'll be family members uh, grieving. And as people come on shifts uh, and as they are sitting in their homes as we speak now, uh, they'll be speaking with each other and grieving amongst each other as the Blue family does. Um, I can't perhaps express to you how deeply felt that will be in the policing family uh, tonight and in the weeks and months ahead. Um, but I know one thing is that uh, Victoria Police, our police PSA members, will come together to support each other and to support the families left behind, um, as they always have and as they always will. Uh, that much is an, is, is an absolute certainty. Uh, those members today, when they started their shift, came to work um, expecting to protect the community. Uh, that much they did do. Uh, that much we are proud of them for doing. Uh, they didn't expect, uh, or we didn't expect that they would lose their lives in that process. Um, but what we saw today is a stark reminder, uh, is a measure of the sacrifice that every police officer, every PSO makes each and every shift when they pull that uniform on, when they put that Freddie in their pocket, um, and come to work and do uh, ordinary things and extraordinary things at some times in an environment to protect the Victorian community. Uh, today, uh, four of the Victorian community, four of our community, have paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, for, protect, for, for protecting all of us. Um, I do want to note and I want to thank some of the emergency service workers, um, ambulance officers and fireys, and I know my colleagues uh, in other unions who are out there in ambulance stations and fire stations tonight supporting their members who have come to the aid of our members at the side of the road. Um, uh, we won't forget that support that they've given our members today uh, and we'll stand by you should you need us in the future as well. Um, this will be a difficult time. This will be a difficult time for Victorians. It'll be a difficult time for our members but I think we'll get through this together. Um, and, uh, and I ask, I ask that uh, as indeed all of you who will know some members of Victoria Police, if you could extend that support um, in the community, it will go a long way to help e ease some of that pain and some of that grief that uh, so many will be feeling. Wayne, have you spoken to their families? We haven't, we haven't spoken to their families at this stage. They're being notified by Victoria Police, to be quite honest, as we stand here right now. Um, but we certainly have teams um, in police stations, in locations around the state at the moment, supporting groups of members who attend at the scenes, groups of members who are presently investigating um, what's occurred, uh, and members from those stations who are colleagues, friends, indeed family members um, of, of, of those members who are following today. Uh, they're out there supporting those people, as our members would expect that we would be doing at this point in time. But they're supporting each other. Um, there's little you can do, to be quite honest, to help people in circumstances like this. You just have to be there. Um, but there's 17,400 people being there right now, and they're being there with each other. Uh, whether they're at work or whether they're at home, uh, they're with each other. They're standing side by side, as, 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 as indeed they did when they marched out of that parade ground. They're standing side by side together now. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to do that at this stage because, as I said, uh, those families are still being notified. But suffice to say that there are, are members who have had an incredibly short period of service and some members who, who you'd consider to be exceptionally um, long-serving veterans. Um, this tragedy uh, spans both extremes in that regard. Um, it shows how, just how vulnerable uh, all members of Victoria Police, all members of Victoria Police are uh, whether they be early in their careers or late in their careers, that risk 
uh, that doesn't go away. It doesn't pass with time. Uh, and as I said, each and every day that you stand up, pull that uniform on, or put that Freddie in your pocket, um, to some extent, you, you make a little sacrifice every day on behalf of the community. And those members took the and made the ultimate sacrifice tonight. As the news filtered into you, what was your overriding emotion? I was just absolutely floored, to be quite honest. Um, as I said, you know, in some regard, it's disbelief. You need to check that, that what you're hearing is quite correct. Um, as I said, to you know, in my career, I've seen and, and felt the loss of other members, but to lose four on one occasion in one instance is it, it's, it's shocking. Um, and, it, and it will shock, as I said to you, that the, the scale of that will shock police in stations across Victoria. Um, it would be hard to think that there'd be a station. Uh, in Victoria that wouldn't have known, wouldn't have worked with, uh, wouldn't have trained with, wouldn't know somebody that knows one of those members. How does this impact police as a whole when something as tragic as this Well, uh, these police officers were doing something that we do 10 times, 20 times, 30 times a shift, uh, intercepting a motor vehicle at the side of the road. Um, this is the bread and butter of policing. This, this isn't this isn't stuff that you go to or do and expect to be killed doing. Uh, but each and every time a police officer does that uh, for the next little while, um, they'll have this in the back of their minds, there's no doubt. You, 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 this will bring home to our members the risks that they confront each and every day at times when they don't realise they're confronting them. Minister, um, this just really has shocked the entire community. I imagine the uh, Premier as well has been all freaked about this. Uh, yeah. yeah, so look, um, you know, I've uh, both talk, spoken regularly to the Premier, as has the Chief Commissioner, and, you know, I think we both uh, commented when we first had the conversation, just feel really rocked by it, like, really, it really hits you. And, uh, you know, I've uh, had the privilege of being the Police Minister now for nearly seven years, or no, six years, uh, and I have learnt and grown to love Victoria Police. Uh, and its members, its workforce, and this is, you know, is, this is devastating, um, personally devastating, devastating for the whole force. Um, you know, these are a credible group of people who do an incredible job every day, uh, and, you know, you don't want to ever see this happen when you're, you know, you're, it's your, your watch, in a spot, I suppose, and, you know, certainly in my conversations with the Premier tonight, uh, you know, that we just, you know... Wish we, what can we do? How do we, how do we fix this? And there's no fixing other than to stand here and say we grieve with you together, and we're going to continue to support the police members and their families who have um, been affected tonight, and do whatever we can to do that. Many Victorians have been asking that question tonight on social media. Yeah. They've been posting images of the blue ribbon. Um, we've seen just an overwhelming show of support for Victoria Police. Yeah. Perhaps is that something that uh, you know suggests to people? Yeah, and look, I think, you know, look, you know, there's, uh, I think Victoria Police have done an incredible job the last few weeks. Now's the time for people to, you know, really thank them, be out there, you know, as, um, as Wayne has said, just, just a thank you, a nod, a, a wave, a, you know, whatever it is to send a strong message to your local police you see, um, you know, on, on Facebook, on, on social media, you know, send a positive message and thank police for the work that they do. Because it's these moments I'm sure many will think, you know, am I doing, is this the, the right job for me? And their families will be thinking that as well. Um, these are dangerous jobs, but um, we, you know, we, we need our police and we need to support them and we need to acknowledge that they put their lives at risk every day. Um, and um, unfortunately, we've seen that in reality tonight, uh, and communities backing them in, I think, will make a huge difference. Yes. Do you have a message to that force driver who fled the scene and might be able to assist with this investigation? Look, I, I, you know, I, look, I don't want to in any way. There's a, a significant investigation going on tonight. We don't know what's occurred here, you know, in full detail yet. Um, my only message tonight is to Victoria Police members and to the families of those who have lost loved ones tonight. Uh, and that message is, you know, we're with you, we're standing with you. Uh, as a government, we'll continue to do that. Um, and, you know, it's both a personal as well as a professional support that we're offering tonight. I know it's early days, I know it's unprecedented times, but the Chief Commissioner was asked earlier about commemorating these officers. 
um, can the government um, you know, have a role to play in this, particularly in these times as well, where things are different and um, setting through? So look, we'll have this over the next couple of days. Like right now, we've got families still being notified. Uh, so that's where my thoughts are right now. And I understand that there are those issues that we need to think about and confront, and as does Wayne, and we'll do that. But right now, I think the only thing we need to focus on is the fact that we've got four grieving families and friends and the, a grieving work, workforce. Uh, and tonight's about offering um, you know, solidarity with them and support to them. Yeah, so the Premier's organised that and he'll have some more things to say tomorrow. Um, and, you know, we will, the Chief Commissioner and the Premier and I will give an update, given we'll have some more information first thing in the morning. OK, thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks. And that was the Victoria already. Police Commissioner yep, Lisa Neville just reminding people of the sacrifice that police make every single day, something Amelia Turzon, our reporter on the scene, would probably have seen really firsthand as so many of the police and emergency services, Amelia, would have been around responding to this incident. But for those of people who are just joining us, take us through what happened earlier tonight. Well, it's been an incredibly dark night tonight for the Victorian Police Force. What we do know that happened here tonight on one of Melbourne's busiest freeways is that just before six o'clock, uh, police officers in their car pulled over a Porsche as it was speeding along this highway. Now, they've made the decision to impound that person's car and they've called along two other officers to the scene to help them out with that process. Now what we know is that as those four police officers and the driver of that Porsche was standing on the freeway or next to the freeway, it's unclear at this stage, a large semi-trailer has driven along and it's driven straight into the group, killing those four police officers here at the scene. Now, it was just an absolutely chaotic and tragic situation when we arrived to that scene just half an hour afterwards. There were so many sirens going off. There was at least 20 fire trucks here trying to deal with this scene. At one stage, um, one of the cars was actually trapped underneath the truck and the police commissioner has just gone on to describe exactly what a tragic situation it was here tonight. A very tragic night indeed that we're having to respond to. Uh, I believe this is the largest uh, single uh, loss of lives in terms of police lives lost uh, in one incident uh, in the history of uh, Victoria Police. I'm not aware of another occasion uh, when we've lost uh, four uh, Victoria Police members in one uh, incident such as this. So it's a very, uh, very tragic night for Victoria Police and again just highlights the, the dangers that go with doing police work. And of course there is going to be a full investigation uh, and investigations continue as to the driver of the Porsche that was pulled over as well who seems to have disappeared. That's correct. There's a full investigation into what exactly happened here tonight. But what we do know is that the driver of that Porsche who was pulled over fled the scene after this horrific accident took place. So the police force is urging that person to come forward to help them with their investigation. We do also know that the truck driver who careered into this group, it's believed that he had a medical episode either before or after the accident, he was taken to hospital where he is now currently under police guard. Uh, we also do not know the identities of the four police officers who have so tragically lost their lives tonight, but we do know that two of them were constables, two of them were senior constables, uh, three of the four of them were men and there was one woman amongst them. We know that some of them were quite senior, but some of them had just joined the police force, which is just such a staggering insight into uh, what can happen here, whether you're a very senior police officer or very new to the force. The Premier of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, has said tonight that we may not know their names, but we will know they will always be heroes. So a very tragic night here tonight and investigations are still ongoing. And Amelia, just before you leave us, what is the scene there at the moment? I mean, that is such a major freeway. There would have been so many people travelling home. Have they started to clear the area? Will it still be closed off? 
Well, as you can see, it is absolutely deserted on this freeway now. It's been closed in both directions, in and out of Melbourne CBD. The crash site is quite a while behind me. We've been actually instructed by the police not to go any closer because the scene is so distressing. But in the distance, there is still dozens of fire trucks and police cars and other people at this scene. And we've been told that the investigations will be going all night long and potentially this highway could still be closed in the morning. Amelia, appreciate you bringing us all the latest information. Thank you so much. And let's bring you more of that statement from the Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews, which was released earlier tonight. He says, tonight, four police officers lost their lives in the line of duty. And tonight, somewhere in our city, four families' hearts are breaking and our hearts are breaking with them. We grieve alongside them just as we grieve with every member of Victoria Police and every member of our emergency services family. In the coming days, formal investigation will tell us why, how this could possibly have happened. But one thing is already clear, though we may not yet know their names, we will always call them heroes. Well, let's move on to other stories from today. And China has been accused of exploiting the coronavirus pandemic to ramp up its presence in the South China Sea. On Saturday, Beijing announced it established administrative districts on the disputed Parasal and Spratly Islands. Just last week, a Chinese government survey ship was seen tagging an exploration vessel owned by Malaysia's state oil firm Petronas. The government in Kuala Lumpur says the incident occurred within Malaysia's exclusive economic zone. And earlier this month, Vietnam lodged an official protest with Beijing, saying one of its fishing boats was rammed by a Chinese Coast Guard ship near the Paracels. Well, as tensions rise in this crucial maritime trading route, an Australian warship has been conducting training with the US Navy. Here's our defence correspondent, Andrew Green. On increasingly troubled waters, the US Navy's putting on a show of strength joining Australian warship HMAS Parramatta for military exercises through the South China Sea. Since the coronavirus pandemic began, China's rapid military build-up in this disputed region has continued unabated, with Beijing fortifying artificial reefs and confronting other nations who claim the territory as their own. To the Chinese, it's a big opportunity for them to, to, to stake their claims in South China Sea and make it theirs once and for all. The strategic region's also vital for oil supplies. More than 30% of global trade in maritime crude makes its way through here. Now Australia's spending almost $100 million to create a national strategic reserve. We are going to take advantage of historically low fuel prices. It's a very welcome first step after years of successive Australian governments saying that there was no problem. Security experts have long been warning Australia needs to bolster national oil supplies in case of a major crisis. Well, that's arrived and so has the idea of a reserve. But it won't be stored here, instead kept in the United States. Having something in the United States uh, doesn't provide for our national interest to be protected in the way that it should. Now the hunt is on for local storage solutions. Andrew Green, ABC News, Canberra. And we'll have more analysis on the situation in the South China Sea with security expert Dr John Blacksland a little later in the program. Well, a senior doctor on board the Ruby Princess says she was surprised passengers were allowed to disembark in Sydney last month. The doctor is the first person to give evidence to the public inquiry, which began today. The cruise line has been given official orders to leave Australian waters by tomorrow night. It doesn't leave much time for chartered flights to be organised for hundreds of stranded crew members still wanting to get off the ship. Here's Mark Reddy. Welcomed with a luxury hotel room, but not for long. Hours after settling in, nine crew, including two Italians, were put back on a bus. Hold on. And under police escort, driven straight to the airport. Others got to stay the night, including Irish singer Giselle O'Meara, who tested positive for coronavirus while on the Ruby Princess. We're finally on our way home, which is unbelievably exciting. 
The repatriation continued in Port Kembla today, but it was slow, uncertain and at times confusing. Please know we are working through all the necessary approvals to make this happen before the ship sails. But there are a number of challenges to overcome. 115 crew members from nine countries were loaded onto buses. Some were dropped at hotels, others put straight onto planes. 21 of them are infected with COVID-19, forced to quarantine in hotels for 14 days. As more crew checked into hotels, a public inquiry began hearing evidence about the Ruby Princess debacle. One of the ship's doctors said there was no way of testing for coronavirus before the vessel docked in Sydney last month. Because we could not analyse any samples. But it goes without saying that you were not testing everybody on board, were you? No. Even though flu swabs were taken of some sick passengers, all were allowed to disembark at Circular Quay. I was surprised that we were allowed to do that without waiting for the results to come through. And the fact that there were still outstanding uh, COVID-19 swabs for people on board, passengers on board that were unwell with flu-like symptoms, um, it was also a risk to allow those people to go out amongst the community. Um, I would agree with you. With the ship given official orders to leave tomorrow, there's this warning from the police commissioner. Everyone's had plenty of time to organise charter flights, including Carnival. And some consulates, including the Philippines, are now scrambling to get stranded crew on flights before the ship finally heads home. Mark Reddy, ABC News, Sydney. Human trials are about to begin in Britain on a vaccine that it's hoped will stop the COVID-19 pandemic in its tracks. Australian researchers are playing a crucial role, but scientists caution we're still in the very early stages of finding a vaccine to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Here's Bridget Brennan. Under fire for its delayed response to COVID-19, the British government is now funding two multi-million dollar vaccine trials. This is uncertain science but I'm certain that we will throw everything we've got at developing a vaccine. Oxford University researchers will begin a safety trial on humans tomorrow. We're also very interested to see whether or not it can prevent cases of coronavirus disease. And so that, that's why we need to, to get on and start the testing in humans. Currently, there are more than 60 vaccines in development, with 20 countries working on trials. Australia is among them, along with scientists from Israel to Denmark, Canada to India. The vaccine being trialled in the UK passed its first hurdle at the CSIRO's Australian Animal Health Laboratory in Geelong. We've just successfully grown the virus. The vaccine, when it was given to, uh, uh, to, to these ferrets, uh, there was there were no adverse reactions to the to the to the vaccine, so we know that the uh, uh, the, the vaccine is at least safe. Australian researchers believe human trials will begin here this year. These vaccines that are going into people now, there's still much more development in many more people uh, before we're actually at the point that the vaccine is ready. Normally, vaccine development takes years, not months. It's right up there top of the list in terms of urgency. So people have moved at absolute blinding speed, in my opinion. In the long run, a coronavirus vaccine will also need to be affordable and widely available to the billions of people who need it. Bridget Brennan, ABC News. Well, let's get more on those trials and other developments out of Europe. We're joined from London by ABC correspondent Lyndon Besser. Lyndon, it looks like the UK may be the worst affected country in uh, Europe. Um, th they seem to be playing catch up. Is that one of the reasons they've thrown their weight behind these human trials? Well, uh, you know, the UK government used to have, it's, it's been said, the best pandemic preparedness package of policies and stockpiles and protocols anywhere in the world. But after the GFC, after the, those crippling austerity measures, um, slowly, bit by bit, those protocols were relaxed. The stockpiles were allowed to run down. Um, a lot of that kit went past its expiry date. And, and the issue wasn't top of mind in many government committees and, and clearly it was allowed to, um, 
to fester like that until now. And that's why this is becoming the COVID response here in Britain is becoming something of a political scandal on a couple of fronts. One is testing. Uh, the government's been promising 100,000 tests a day for some time. They're nowhere near it, and they don't seem to be able to quite explain uh, what the problem is. Um, and then the other really perhaps more critical issue is, is that of personal protective equipment. Now, of course, there's a global shortage um, uh, suppliers simply can't keep up, and, uh, and the big suppliers are all in China. Um, but we've had the situation here in Britain where some frontline healthcare workers have had to use bin liners as protective equipment. Last Friday, uh, Public Health England, Bev, said that, um, you know, issued a new directive that uh, health workers should consider reusing their PPE. That's the extent of the shortage. The debacle is so bad that on Saturday, the government said that a new stockpile of gowns, several hundred thousand of them, Bev, would be transported from Turkey uh, last weekend. Well, uh, come Monday, there was still no sign of them. There, there were questions about whether Turkey had even confirmed the order. And so Britain sent an RAF plane over to Turkey to keep the pressure up. And that plane sat on the tarmac for a day or two. It was only a couple of hours ago that it arrived back here with a few hundred thousand gowns. Uh, so it really, you know, behind the scenes, I think there's a lot of panic, um, uh, the left hand not talking to the right hand. Indeed, and, there, and there's been talk that medical workers will actually work off, walk off the job because they are the front line of this pandemic. Yeah, that's right. And, of course, in ICUs and in, and in the hospital setting, you know, th there's a lot more equipment. Uh, you know, it's far more acute. But then, you, 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 you know, you go and talk about aged care homes... Uh, and other care facilities, uh, and and workers are going, you know, and these are very lowly paid workers, mind you, going in uh, to these facilities, and they are literally putting themselves on the line, uh, and often they just don't have any kid at all. There was a story of a 26-year-old uh, care worker who died last week in London after two weeks in ICU, and all that she had was the basic kit that she would ordinarily have um, in these homes. So. You know, there are calls here for a full public inquiry, perhaps a bit like the Ruby Princess inquiry in New South Wales, that gets to the bottom of, of how this was allowed to happen in a country as wealthy as the UK. Now, uh, if we look across the continent, of course, Germany, that has also been quite hit by the pandemic, is starting to ease some of the lockdown measures. What's going to be changing for the Germans? Well, that's the real contrast. On the continent, a lot of these economies are reopening and they're doing it very gradually. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, chafing at the bit in Britain for that to be allowed to happen. Well, you know, the UK is a long way off when you have a look at, uh, you know, Germany and, and Norway. Uh, you know, th these countries are relaxing their restrictions. Uh, Czech Republic as well. They're doing it in stages. They're allowing some students back wearing masks with distance between them. Smaller shops in Germany are allowed to reopen before the larger ones. And they're doing it, Bev... Linton seems... ...because they're able to uh, distribute hundreds of thousands of masks to civilians. Extraordinary. You were just breaking up a little there, but uh, good to get that update from you. Thanks, Linton. Watching the world, our top stories tonight. Victoria Police is mourning the deaths of four officers in a horror crash on a Melbourne freeway. Tensions are rising in the South China Sea where a Chinese government survey ship is in an international maritime dispute with Malaysia. And Missouri has become the first US state to sue Beijing over its handling of the coronavirus. Now, as we've been reporting this evening, four police officers were killed in a horror crash on Melbourne's Eastern Freeway earlier this evening. Victoria Police Chief Commissioner Graham Ashton says it's the largest loss of police life in a single incident in the state's history. At about 5.40pm uh, tonight, uh, two members of Victoria Police who were doing uh, road policing duties have intercepted a, a Porsche, a 911 Porsche, uh, which was, had been travelling at speed, excessive speed, uh, on the inbound lanes of the Eastern Freeway. And that vehicle intercept has occurred and those members have stopped that vehicle in the left stopping lane uh, of the freeway. 
Uh, and as part of doing that, um, they have uh, made inquiries with the occupant of the vehicle. Uh, as a result of those inquiries, they've taken the decision to impound uh, the vehicle based on the inquiries they were making. Uh, they've requested support from two further highway patrol officers who have then attended the scene in support. Uh, and once those officers have arrived at the scene, they've not long been at the scene to assist with all four uh, police officers uh, out of their vehicles uh, with this particular person in terms of making those inquiries and conducting that vehicle impound. Uh, the, uh, a, a large truck, a refrigerated truck, has then uh, driven uh, into these four police officers. Uh, that uh, conference a little earlier this evening, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, tweeted his reaction to the fatal crash in Victoria. He says it was awful, heartbreaking news that those four officers were killed while on duty in Melbourne. He says his deepest sympathies go out to their families, fellow officers and friends at this terrible time. And also we heard from the police minister a little earlier saying that flags would be flying in Victoria at half-mast. And the, the sober reminding that in fact so many of our police officers right around the country are at the front line of policing the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And she did make the point that it is time for all of us right around the country to, to say hello and to, to say thank you for the very difficult work that they do for us each day. Now let's return to the South China Sea and experts are warning of a very dangerous situation unfolding where a Chinese government survey ship and its Coast Guard escorts are in an international maritime dispute with Malaysia. Asian maritime expert Gregory Poling says the ongoing dispute is approaching breaking point. If I'm looking for one area um, that I think is going to deteriorate or maybe decide this issue over the next couple of years, it is the energy sector because it's the one area where if the Chinese continue this pressure campaign, Hanoi and Kuala Lumpur, I think probably not Manila, but the other two might actually have to draw a line. Um, Vietnam is getting to a point where it's impossible to get foreign investors into its energy sector offshore, and it just can't stand for that. Exxon might pull out soon. For Malaysia, Petronas is the golden goose. It provides most of the state budget. They can't sit by and agree that Petronas can no longer drill offshore. And this is a time when the oil price, oil futures, has gone into negative territory. So a very critical juncture, too, for Australia to consider. Let's uh, talk to John Blacksland. He's a professor of international security and intelligence at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre in Canberra. John, lovely to talk with you this evening. Is this near breaking point, as we just heard in your view, having watched this for so many years now? Uh, look, yes and no. Uh... There's a game of brinkmanship that's going on here, but it's been going on for several years. Uh, and China has become quite expert at playing this brinkmanship game, but with a very clear understanding of the limits of how far it seems to be prepared to go. China has assiduously avoided crossing a threshold of kinetic warfare. It has pushed the envelope. It has uh, slowly, increasingly um, drawn in... Uh, taken territory, seized islands, seized shoals, tested the waters, but then retreated a little bit when there's been a, a reaction. And when there hasn't been a reaction, China's been prepared to go the next step. And so what we're seeing is a, a policy that I think really reflects the, the art of the Chinese strategist, the ancient Chinese strategist Sun Tzu, which is about uh, playing every angle of, of the state's power to exercise the most advantage for the political objectives. Uh, so it's understandable they're doing that, but I do think that they are responsive to counter pressure. But everybody's afraid to go there at the moment. And, and because we're in the middle of a global pandemic, it seems like an, a very opportunistic move by China. In fact, it's getting a little bit too cynical. And I think this is one of the things that's really starting to uh, it crystallize in people's minds. The sense that China is being quite exploitative at the moment and its actions have become just a little bit too clever by half. Uh, while many are obviously keen for Chinese investments, the way that the coronavirus or COVID-19 has been handled by China, the way it's manipulated the World Health Organization, the way it's it kind of 
obfuscated with information about its own problems and the nature of the problems and just exactly how the, the virus has developed and how it spilled out into the open. And then just managing the, the, the kind of really kind of a little bit tacky PR about gifting, you know, some of the in, in personal protective equipment and then selling it. And then at the same time, conducting operations off the Taiwan Strait, uh, off the Taiwan coast, in a way that kind of speaks to a, it echoes of the of the the protest of, of the parade, I should say, of last year, the 70th anniversary parade, where she, uh, on top of this military vehicle, led this parade that was extraordinarily militarist, echoes of the Cold War, and in fact of the interwar period of the of the great military parades of the 1930s eerily reminiscent of that and it's when you when you ag aggregate the, all these factors i think it, particularly we think about the positions of maurice payne our foreign minister and even peter dutton who've been criticized vilified almost by the chinese for their positions um you get a sense that maybe their positions aren't that unreasonable actually and, and my sense is also this they're a little bit thin-skinned you know that they protest using shrill language over a modest and, I think, fairly reasonable uh, uh, positional statement over legitimate concerns. And, and to your point, uh, some countries don't want to go there, John. I mean, we are conducting mm. joint exercises with the US. The US is in the region. They are pushing back, but also seriously distracted by the pandemic in the US. Um, as you mm. point out, our politicians are slapped down. We're treated almost with outright disdain by the Chinese. It's a difficult relationship at the moment to manage. But it's words. And this is the thing. China's really good with words, but we know that there's a threshold they don't want to cross. They don't want to cross because they don't want to invoke the wrath of the United States. They know that the way things stand at the moment, despite all the rhetoric to the contrary, they would not win in a, in a kinetic war. So what they do is they huff and they puff, and they're very good at it. And, and it's very intimidating if you're in a small Southeast Asian maritime neighbouring state worried about trade and investment and tourists from China and how China might use its military prowess against you. Using those words has, has actually been remarkably successful for China. The point has been reached, I would argue, though, that, in fact, there is a legitimate protest that can be launched, uh, lodged, I should say, and and that the United States and Australia have a legitimate role to play. Interestingly enough here too, Bev, but you look around Southeast Asia, no one's out loudly declaring their support for Australia and the United States, but everybody's kind of quietly saying, good on you, yeah. thanks for doing it, because they don't want to get offside with China, but they're really keen for the United States to stay and they respect Australia's role in this as well. So, John, what are your thoughts? Some analysts are saying that there will be an exist, there will be an order shift to the existing power structure, i.e., US, China, Russia's in there, of course, somewhere as well. So, mm. after this pandemic, do you agree that that might happen? It, it certainly seems to be on the cards. We're seeing the United States uh, undertaking what I would call an ideational retreat, uh, a, a, a transactional retreat, I should say from ideational leadership. They're just vacant from the field. They're not They're not actively leading in response. And in the past, you know, we've looked at the United States to lead and they haven't. And we, and we look at the alternative, we see China, China acting in a very cynical kind of transactional and uh, petty way uh, uh, in, in its way it's dealing with the crisis. So it, there's not much hope around it. And I guess it's one of the reasons why I think Australian foreign policy has shifted in, into a direction where I'm I call Australia's foreign policy plan B, which is declared, articulated in the foreign policy white paper two years ago. And that was basically, we're, we're kind of losing faith in, in the major, the great powers, and we're looking around now for partnerships with others who might be interested, who see the world like us, who want the United States to play. They want a constructive relationship with China, but they're afraid of China, and they're also keen to find some other buffer, some other mechanism that they can draw on to actually stand up on their own without being pushed around and completely thrown off game. And this is where I think ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, has a role to play, and also uh, other bilateral and multilateral relationships with Indonesia, Japan, India, and anyone else who wants to play with Australia. John, always great to get your perspective. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the program.
Well, Missouri has become the first US state to sue the Chinese government over its handling of the coronavirus pandemic. The civil lawsuit alleges negligence on Beijing's part, which has led to devastating economic losses in the state. It's seeking cash compensation, possibly into the billions. Here's Yvonne Young. Protesters in Kansas City defying stay-at-home orders. They're not the only ones feeling the economic pressure of prolonged business closures due to coronavirus. State officials blame China for the turmoil Missouri finds itself in. The Chinese government lied to the world about the danger and contagious nature of COVID-19, says Attorney General Eric Schmidt. It silenced whistleblowers and did little to stop the spread of the disease. They must be held accountable for their actions. A civil lawsuit filed against the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party seeks damages to make up for the enormous loss of life, human suffering and economic turmoil resulting from the pandemic. It alleges Missouri and its residents have suffered possibly tens of billions of dollars in damages and accuses China of making things worse by hoarding personal protective equipment. China has dismissed these accusations as nothing short of absurdity. This so-called lawsuit is an abuse of litigation which violates basic legal principles. It does face other similar lawsuits filed in US courts on behalf of business owners. It seems extremely unlikely, even under international law, um, let alone factoring in the attitude of the Chinese government, um, that they can go very far because under US law, uh, foreign countries are exempt from being sued in the, the American civil sort of court system. So yeah, I, I can't see it going anywhere. I think this is just a, a way to um, get a bit of publicity for the, uh, the attorney general in question. Nearly two dozen Republican lawmakers have asked the Trump administration to bring a case against China to the International Court of Justice. Critics say it's a tactic used to draw attention away from the government's own mistakes in handling the pandemic. Meanwhile, the Missouri governor has reassured residents that steps are being taken to reopen the economy, albeit at a gradual pace. Yvonne Yong, ABC News. Well, Singapore, which has been lauded for its response to the pandemic, is now dealing with a huge jump in cases after an outbreak among foreign workers who live in dormitories. Experts say the surge in cases shows what can happen if authorities become complacent. Here's our ABC correspondent, Jake Sturmer. Migrant workers underpin Singapore's construction industry. But their cramped living conditions mean highly infectious diseases like coronavirus can spread rapidly. Singapore seemed to have the virus under control, but it's been caught out. No matter how well prepared you are, any blind spots, you know, try and find them now. Professor Dale Fisher and his colleagues have this week been inside the dormitories to test and treat workers. Physically distanced, these workers are being advised how to try to contain the outbreak. The community engagement is going to be what's critical. Um, you need to be able to tell people how to protect themselves. Singapore's story shows how damaging one outbreak can be. While cases among these migrant workers have exploded, in the wider community, infection rates have fallen dramatically. Things feel OK. We're still allowed to go out and exercise. Lauren Hendry Parsons is an Australian working in Singapore and isn't too worried about the outbreak. There's been a sense of trust in that so long as we wear our masks, uh, stay indoors, we're going to be OK together. But authorities fear there's a hidden number of cases they don't know about because the number of untraceable infections hasn't come down, so the lockdown's been extended until June. I hope you understand that this short-term pain is to stamp out the virus, protect the health and safety of our loved ones and allow us to revive our economy. A revival that will be watched for the world over, with many countries looking to avoid a similar sudden spike. Jake Sturmer, ABC News. Air pollution has plummeted over northern India to levels not seen in decades during the country-wide lockdown. As the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is celebrated around the world virtually, conservationists say this should be the year we stop taking the planet for granted. Kirsty Johansson reports. 
A global lockdown has offered glimpses of a planet temporarily spared by the daily assault of human activity. From deserted Spanish streets to wild mountain goats roaming Welsh villages and rare blue skies in New Delhi. Factories are shut, no construction happening and because we are not travelling there is no vehicles on the road. And naturally because of that pollution levels have reduced dramatically. According to government data, New Delhi, the world's most populated capital, is experiencing the longest spell of clean air on record. India's pollution monitoring body says the water in the Ganges, India's longest river, has also become fit for bathing. Government needs to really look at this data very, very carefully. That something that was that they were not able to achieve over decades. How did this this mere a few weeks of lockdown? How was it able to achieve it? A new study by IQ Air has compared levels of air pollution in ten major cities around the world during the initial three-week lockdown period compared to the same period in 2019. Seven of those studied saw significant improvements in air quality. New Delhi saw the biggest reduction, with a 60% drop in PM2.5 levels. The South Korean capital Seoul also halved its totals. New York reduced its levels by a quarter, while London recorded the lowest drop in PM2.5 levels at just 9%. But while the restrictions have proved great for nature, Britain is putting vital conservation work on hold. Red squirrels and water voles, they're on the edge of extinction and we're having to do a lot of intervention to keep them here. Conservationists believe the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is an opportunity to push for change. I do believe that for us to protect the planet, we shouldn't only have an Earth Day once a year, but every day should be Earth Day. And every decision we make should be in favour of our planet. And doing that from home is a great start. Kirsty Johansson, ABC News. Well, the keepers of the Anzac tradition are drawing on their ingenuity to overcome the biggest disruption to Anzac Day in a century. The fight against COVID-19 means there are only going to be one officially sanctioned commemoration on Saturday at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. But as National Affairs correspondent Greg Jennett reports, that won't stop veterans, servicemen and women and their relatives marking the day in their own way. At the going down of the sun... <laughs> And in the morning. Lest we forget. She'll remember them only in solitude this year. I'm going to light a candle. I'm going to think about those who have brought the war home, who live in isolation every day uh, because they can't make sense of what they've seen in war. An Iraq war veteran, Sarah Watson, was a warrior for 15 years, came home to fight post-traumatic stress. I just had felt like I'd let... Australia down. And for a time, lost touch with the essence of Anzac. She's rediscovered the spirit, as well as parallels between the call to arms and the communal cry to vanquish a virus. And that really embodies what the Anzac Day spirit is all about. Let's we forget. Down driveways the nation over, Australians confined to their homes will somehow give their own expression to that spirit. While the monuments to mighty losses tower in towns everywhere, they'll mostly go unattended on Saturday, but tended to all the same by voluntary keepers of the eternal flame. I'll be getting up uh, very early in the morning. I'll be putting my uniform on. I'll be coming here and I will be observing a small ceremony. So too at the biggest of them all, the Australian War Memorial. Its locked doors will be prized open for a select few. There'll be no organised march here or anywhere else. And although Australians may not realise it, as they go about their personal commemorations, they'll actually be stepping back another age. It took a while for the idea of an officially sanctioned National Day to evolve, especially after Spanish flu wiped out events in 1919. Finally, in 1920, it happened. And the long march through time began, bunkering down occasionally, only to advance again. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Canberra.
It's been a sombre night and, of course, a sombre couple of months around the world. The global pandemic has left many of us in need of a drink. And fortunately, Devil Wears Prada star Sani Tucci is on hand to provide help in a tutorial described by viewers as inexplicably soothing and a blessing on Twitter. The actor shows step-by-step step how he makes a Negroni for his wife, literary agent Felicity Blunt. And there we are. That's that. You want it, Felicity? That will never happen. <laughs> That's good. Oh. You can also just do it. What taunting. Tucci is the latest celebrity to shake up the quarantini craze earlier this month. Barefoot Contessa author Inna Garten showed off her oversized Cosmopolitan, saying it's always cocktail hour in a crisis. That's one hell of a cocktail. Let's hope Graham Creed's been keeping off the cocktails. Here he is with the weather. We've got a fairly active cold front moving up towards the southeastern states tomorrow. Now, this is going to trigger the potential of some showers and thunderstorms into South Australia and Victoria. We could even see some storms about the northwest of Tasmania. For the mainland, the rainfall is going to be quite patchy. It will be far more widespread in Tasmania, although it's going to take a, a while for it to move through to the east. It won't reach Hobart until overnight, and the eastern parts of the state will only see light falls. And away from that southeast corner, there is very little in the way of rainfall to talk about. Just a few isolated showers about the northeast tropics of Queensland, one or two about the coastal northern fringe of the Territory, and just a few about the far southwest of WA. Now, before we go, just reminding you of our top story tonight. Victoria Police is mourning the death of four officers after a horror freeway crash. And that is the shape of the world tonight. If you'd like to see more interviews, take a look at the ABC's YouTube channel. I'll see you after this break. Poland's new crusade. The government has declared this to be an LGBT free zone. The church and state in an unholy alliance. The attackers think that they have got the blame.